Okay, I promised some more ideas for linguistic motion charts, and here they are. What we've seen in the last tutorial was a study of the collocational preferences of may and might, and how they changed over time. And that was done using the contrast function of the Koha interface. And you can imagine you could do very similar studies with pairs of synonyms like hot and warm, or pairs of antonyms like man and woman, or black and white, and stuff like that. But there are lots of other options that maybe require a little more data processing, but they're certainly worth exploring. So one thing that I'd like to show you concerns zero-derived nouns and verbs. English has lots of elements like drink, hope, and place, point, fool, change, and so on and so forth, that can be used as both a noun and a verb. So there is change, but you can also change things. <clears throat> I, for many of these, don't have a clear intuition about their distribution. So is change primarily verbal or primarily nominal? I'm not sure. Um, what about fool? I don't know. So I identified orthographic overlaps between the thousand most frequent nouns and verbs in Koha, and that search gave me some 150 elements that occur both as nouns and verbs. And then I went ahead and got their Koha frequencies by searching for them one by one. <clears throat> Maybe not elegant, but it does the job. So I typed in, uh, in the chart interface, I typed in end, dot, and then the noun tag. So that gives me all nominal usages of end. And you see those are the frequencies of nominal end throughout the entire corpus. I did a parallel search for all the verbal ends, and you see that here the curve is different. Okay, So this procedure then gave me two tables, one with all the verb frequencies, so a count as a verb occurs 30 times in the 1810s, 481 times in the 1820s, and so on and so forth. So I have all the elements in their verbal usages and all the elements with their nominal frequencies. Okay. That's the raw data that the analysis is based on. And from this format, you need to get the data into a format that looks like this again, where you have one column with the decade, one column with the word that you're uh, analyzing, and then <clears throat> the per million frequency of how often this element is used verbally and how often it is used nominally. And you see that the count is more of a noun than it is a verb, and act is fairly even balanced. It's a frequent verb, but also a frequent noun. Again, different uh, a diff score, and then the combined frequency of verbs per million and nouns per million. Okay, um, so what does that look like? All right, here's the graph, and um, you see we've got the verb frequencies on the x-axis, and the noun frequencies on the y-axis <clears throat> and the more yellowish stuff is verby and the bluish stuff is nouny. So head and name, those are predominantly nouns and look and call, they're predominantly verbs. Yeah, okay. Um, right, I want to show you one other thing. And for that we have to go multivariate. Because what we've seen up to now just contrasts two x's, x and y. But many linguistic phenomena, of course, are much more complex than that. Um, usually we're dealing with lots of variables and, um, well, things are complicated. Scatter plots can, however, do more than just display bivariate distributions. We can have um, some statistical techniques such as multidimensional scaling or principal components analysis or correspondence analysis that can squeeze multivariate data into a two-dimensional space. And that's what we're going to look at now. So, um, as an example here, I chose English complement-taking verbs. Verbs such as expect, like, or imagine they project some syntactic complement structure that can take different shapes. So expect occurs with NPs, I expect a visitor, 
it occurs with two infinitives, I expect to hear from John. With that clauses, I expect that John will win. Or in brazing constructions, as they're called, uh, I expect John to do well on the exam. Okay, and you can imagine, um, expect has a certain frequency profile, so it occurs predominantly with two infinitives, not so much with NPs or their clauses. And other verbs than expect, like, will have a different profile, right? So you can compare expect, like, and all the other verbs with regard to these multidimensional profiles and try to represent that on a two-dimensional surface. Okay, so here I just have five verbs compared expect, hope, enjoy, suggest, and mention. And you can immediately see that suggest and mention are very similar in their syntactic profiles and expect, hope, and enjoy, they're fairly different from one another, right? Um, maybe enjoy is sort of the closest to suggest and mention, but it's hard to tell really. Okay, um, from such a frequency profile, <clears throat> you can derive what's called a distance matrix, okay? Um, and from such distance matrices, you can get a two-dimensional plot. Um, there is a lot of literature out there on how exactly that functions, um, and I'll leave you to explore that on your own. Just um, to make sense of this graph here, mention and suggest, they're very similar, so they're plotted close to one another. And what distinguishes them from the others is that they have a really strong preference for that clauses. Okay? Enjoy. What makes enjoy stand out from the set is that it has a real strong preference for NPs. Expect has a very strong preference for two infinitives. Okay? And so it makes sense for hope to be here in between expect and the mention suggest cluster because hope sort of shares the preferences of mention and suggest and expect to equal degrees. So hope occurs to similar degrees with two infinitives and with that clauses, so it makes sense for it to be there in the middle. And hope has almost no NPs, so it makes sense for it to be far away from enjoy. Okay, so the idea now is if you have distance matrices for all the different decades from your corpus, you can plot many um, maps and you can then watch them in sequence in a flipbook-like fashion. Okay, so <clears throat> the data that I got was I analyzed 45 verbs from the literature on English complement-taking verbs, things like expect, like, try, suggest, mention, confirm, and so on. And for each of these, I um, got the frequencies of six subcategorization frames from the Koha. And here I used the tagging that is available in the Koha interface. So that clauses I searched for by saying, all right, give me the verb confirm, then give me the complementizer that, okay? In clauses, I retrieved by looking for the verb confirm and then a uh, ing form following that, and so on and so forth. Right, uh, here's a snippet of the data. You can imagine that's a lot of searches to be done, but it's, um, it works. Okay, so here are the different search patterns, and here are the frequencies for all the 20 Koha decades. <clears throat> and this is what comes out as a plot for the first decade that I plotted, the 1870s. So we have verbs like try and want and expect up here, need, um, then this big cluster here, and a few less frequent verbs down here. These here show a common preference for that clauses, so uh, you know that, you doubt that, you affirm that. The ones up here like two infinitives, like want, try, expect, need, and the verbs down here, they occur mostly with NPs, confirm, appreciate, and await. Right, um, so we have two dimensions, one that is sort of a continuum between that clauses and two infinitives, and another one that is a continuum between nominal complementation patterns and more complex verbal complementation patterns. That's 
what we're looking at when we view this space. Okay, the data frame for this analysis looks something like this. We have, again, the timestamps um, in the decade column, the different verbs in the word column, <clears throat> the x values and the y values, and then the combined frequencies of the verbs. Okay, um, let's look at this. Okay, this is what it comes out initially, and for color I choose the x-axis, and for size I choose the frequency. And now I can select different verbs that interest me, and play the thing. Okay. One thing that's interesting about this graph is that in the 2000s, there's a lot more going on in the middle of the graph than in the beginning, during the 1870s. So I'm going to select these verbs here. Remember, consider, appreciate, dislike, enjoy, love, and hate that occupy the middle section of the graph. And if you turn back time, you can see that, wait, they didn't used to be there all the time, right? Um, back in the 1870s, remember and consider were that clause verbs. Love, hate, and dislike were two infinitive verbs. And enjoy and appreciate were basically nominal verbs. And uh, okay, we'll replay that. <clears throat> As time goes on, they all converge towards the middle of the graph. And um, essentially, that means that they develop a common preference, namely for in clauses. They all occur with more in clauses towards the end of the Koha corpus. All right. Um, if you have questions or comments, um, I'd be really happy for you to email me. And um, if you decide you want to do your own motion charts, I'd be thrilled to learn about them. All right. Thanks, and see you soon.